Hello, Jeff Boggs here. This is the week seven Peterborough mini lecture, and it revolves around answering the question, or perhaps more clearly posing the question of why build the Trent Severn Waterway? It's useful when we think about the Trent Severn Waterway, or what we now call the Trent Severn Waterway, it's useful to realize that it had a difficult start in being developed. So its first canals were built in the, in the, sorry, the 1830s, but they did not actually link up with either Lake Ontario or Lake Huron through Georgian Bay. And so it's the initial canals were built by private investors and they didn't span the entire system of what we now think of as the Trent Severn Waterway. There was more construction uh, that took place after 1834. And if you sort of look back on the history of the construction of the waterways, there's often lots of cases of it being added to or modified or locks being made bigger in particular. Uh, but early on, it had its construction interrupted in 1837 by the Upper Canada Rebellion, in which then uh, the government began to realize, or the, I guess the British Crown began to realize that there were some problems with something called the Family Compact, which was uh, operating, uh, according to its detractors, uh, Upper Canada for the benefit of the family and not for the people that actually lived in Upper Canada, which is now covers part of what we think of as Ontario. But this interruption then means that the addition to this system was slow and that actually what happens is that some of these locks that were supposed to be added to the initial system of canals uh, were not turned into locks, but something called timber slides. And so timber slides are usually fairly narrow chutes <clears throat> that you literally float logs into, because you have to remember at this time, there's lots of timber extraction. So trees are being felled and then sort of a, their, their limbs are being shorn off. And then the sort of trunk of the tree is being floated uh, down river or through a system of canals to eventually get to a sawmill. And because there was so much timber uh, cutting in the area, the timber industry didn't really want to see locks built because locks force the water to stop and before and then have to be opened up as the water levels equalize. And people that sell timber so people that are floating logs down rivers to get eventually to sawmills, they don't like locks because the timber will run up against the lock and then become chipped or damaged on the end, uh, but also can likewise damage the locks, which at this time would have been made out of big chunks of wood, or sort of large uh, logs and large, large pieces of planed wood. And so the timber in industry sort of, uh, gets the new locks that are being added to be turned into timber slides. And often timber slides aren't big enough for anything more than a log. Sometimes they're actually wider than that. But often uh, the thing about a timber slide is that if you think of a slide or a water slide, for instance, you might think of it as kind of a glorified water slide that you feed logs into. And it's in some cases not much wider than the largest log. Uh, but you have this continuous flow of logs uh, down the waterway uh, around where the lock would normally be. And it allows for a more kind of continuous transportation of logs without damaging them. So there was already then at this time kind of local resistance to adding locks to the waterway. And instead, you know, a particular industry favored these things called timber slides. Furthermore, you end up with a system that for many years is this closed system of water travel. And so as the canals are sort of being added to, they allow some locations 
within the area covered to more rapidly connect with each other by water travel. But if you want to actually get outside of that system, in a particular, if you want to get to Lake Ontario or Lake Huron, you have to take roads, which at this time would have been things like plank roads or toll roads also, that might have been plank roads, uh, but also railroads. So it was not in a particularly, uh, I guess the early years of the TSW, the Tr Trent Severn Waterway, were not particularly uh, auspicious, we might say. Even before the first canals were built in the Trent Severn Waterway, or what we now call the Trent Severn Waterway, there was uh, a lot of stiff competition and, and basically reasons to suggest that building these canals was you know, financially a bad idea. So, so we have, even though you know, before the 1830s, when the first canal is built, even before this time, there were already uh, other sources of competition that had opened up to provide sort of a similar service, though not in the area around what we now think of, of as Peterborough and the Kawarthas Lakes. So there was the Welland Canal. So the first Welland Canal is finished, I want to say around 1825. And you know, by the 1850s, I believe there's construction on a second Welland Canal, and then later in the 1870s, 1880s, a third Welland Canal, and then in the 1920s, there's a fourth Welland Canal. It's actually it might be the 1930s when they start on that. Anyway, the point is that there is already within Canada itself, or what we now think of as Canada, already a canal system that connects that connects the Great Lakes to each other. And it's shorter, actually, than the Trent Severn Waterway as it exists now as well. But that's another issue. So there is already the Welland Canal. There's also the Erie Canal in the United States, which allowed, uh, and which was part of the reason the Welland Canal was built, because the Erie Canal allowed anyone on the upper Great Lakes, so basically from Lake Erie on higher, to ship directly along these canals to New York City and not to Montreal. So part of why the Welland Canal was built was to better integrate the sort of uh, transportation system uh, for shipping in what we now think of as Canada, but also to make it easier to direct traffic to Montreal, even though that was still a bit complicated as well. Because you have to remember that in the 1800s, Montreal is the port in Canada. And so in addition to these two canals, so the Erie Canal, I think, is completed in 1823 or 1824 and was already in operation before then. Uh, in addition to those canals, these canals are also then uh, running up against railroads. And steam-powered railroads had begun to emerge on the seam as a viable substitution for canals. Railroads are generally easier to install than canals and generally require less upkeep. I mean, there are special cases where that where a canal actually works better, but in a lot of cases, you know, the reason we today don't see you know so many canals on the landscape is that because uh, they were beat out in terms of kind of cost for getting goods to market uh, by railroads and then later by cars. So. So we've got these three forces operating in the background during the calls for building and expanding what we now call the Trent Severn Waterway. And so most of the people that wanted to see it expanded were primarily locals that would benefit from it. So de despite all of this competition, by the 1880s, we see sort of a construction begin on a system of locks and canals that would connect Lake Ontario to Lake Huron via Georgian Bay. And then this is ultimately completed in 1920. So, so eventually this canal system is built, but one has to wonder what is the use of a canal system like 
uh, built at this late of a date. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide. With the previous slide in mind, then it's fairly obvious that by the time that Trent Severn Waterway was completed in 1920, the heyday of canals was over. Certainly as a source of, uh, you know, low cost transportation in all but a few industries. So it's still, even today, fairly uh, cost effective for shipping, you know, bulk goods like iron ore or coal or grain over long distances, as long as you don't have to keep moving it out of one ship into the other. With this in mind, though, even though this heyday was over, the, like all canals, the Trent Severn Waterway had other uses. One that we often underestimate nowadays with, you know, electrical wires and sort of electricity being easy to transmit at great distances through power systems is that at one time, water power was really the only dependable, I mean, to a lesser degree, wind power, uh, but water power was the only dependable power source for traditional mills. And so when I, I mean a mill here, you might think of a flour mill, but actually there were lots of other kinds of mills as well. And a mill refers to kind of an early, it's not qu quite a factory, uh, though I guess some eventually did turn into factories, but it, it refers to initially a, a building that's attached uh, to a, a building, another building, or maybe the same building with a water wheel or multiple water wheels that are turned by flowing water and then through a system of uh, gears, pulleys and so on, this power is then transmitted to machines and these machines then, you know, do the same task repeatedly. So we see early, you know, woolen mills set up in first the United Kingdom uh, and then later in North America and in continental Europe uh, that are powered by water power initially. And then, you know, by the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, these traditional mills are starting or, you know, have begun to sort of uh, be replaced by hydroelectric power generation. And so this is a case where, you know, the water turns a turbine that then, you know, powers a generator that generates electricity. And so canals then, did have other important uses even during this time. So one being that they provided a source of power. Though how that power was harnessed, you know, varies over time. The second use is that all canals allow you to mitigate the effects of flooding at least up to a point until they sort of become you know, over full. But in general, canals are useful for controlling, you know, the release of water as well as the level of water, you know, in a particular waterway system. And they also control the timing of water release. So if you know that it's going to rain really hard, what you might actually do is empty out some of the uh, parts of the of the canal system that are close to one of the Great Lakes. And then as everything upstream starts to fill in, now you have some sort of spare capacity to capture the water from further back upstream uh, to prevent it from overflowing the, its banks and flooding people's houses or fields or that sort of thing. The third use is that, you know, it becomes a tourist boating route. And one of the interesting things about the, the Kawarthas is that, you know, there are reports of even in like the 1880s, 1890s of wealthy Americans, for instance, coming and staying the whole summer up in cottage country uh, as kind of a, an annual tradition. So whether it be for a week or, you know, particularly wealthy families would come for a long, much longer than a week. And so, you know, at least for kind of North American upper crust, uh, 
uh, or wealthy people, the Kawartha's uh, charm as a tourist destination was only amplified by having you no know, opportunities for local boating as well. Because if you think about it, boating is uh, usually requires uh, at least a middle class income. Maybe not always, I suppose, if you come from a family of fisher people. But for a lot of sort of sail boating, that often uh, people that sell boat, people that own sailboats, tend to be wealthier than people that don't. So, and because you have to remember, these are pleasure craft. They're not actually working craft. Craft. You're not using them to generate revenue to make any money. It's something that you have as perhaps a an a, an item of conspicuous consumption, or uh, you know, allowing you to uh, partake in recreational activities that most of the teeming masses can't afford. So even though the TSW was completed in 1920, and even though it faced competition from you know, the Welland Canal, the Erie Canal, and then later, and actually by the time it was built also by railroads that are starting to be laid, there were still other sort of economically beneficial uses of it. Skipping ahead a bit, we see that since about 1972, Parks Canada has operated the Trent Severn Waterway. To me, this suggests that by 1972, the Trent Severn Waterways, it's really its main business justification, was no longer you know, uh, as a source of power for industries or as a source of you know, hydroelectricity or as a, a way, you know, to, I guess, as a, a form of commercial transportation. So none of those were particularly all that important by this time. What was important was tourism and also related habitat protection. So because some tourists that go to the Quarthas like to fish, for instance. So, or, you know, if they're on their sailboats or motorboats, they like to look at the beautiful landscape around it. Uh, so this, leads me to think that Parks Canada sort of starts to manage the Trent Severn Waterway partially because it is no longer a commercially viable enterprise. And so there are tourism related businesses that benefit from it, uh, but that lots of the other groups that, you know, in the past would have agitated to keep it open or would have even paid to keep it open, you know, are no longer interested in doing that, and that it's looking for someone to foot its bill. This is a bit cynical, but often this is what happens with uh, infrastructure that is no longer as important as it used to be, as it used to be, but might be able to be described in, as something having some kind of, you know, historical worth or, you know, uh, worth in that it protects or otherwise, you know, enhances the national, the natural environment. What this means, though, for the tourist industry is that op the opening hours of locks and usage fees are determined by Parks Canada and not locally. So I suspect there's some local influence in this, but that ultimately if Parks Canada is paying the fee to sort of manage this waterway and they don't, it's not Parks Canada with just one site at the Trent Severn, that, and that site being the Trent Severn waterway, it's Parks Canada having to juggle different priorities across the entire country of Canada, which is very large. And so what this means is that for the local tourist industry, what's good for them may not actually be good for Parks Canada and vice versa. And we see in about the last 10 years, uh, some discussion, some arguments about how Parks Canada by making it basically uh, by reducing the hours in which the locks are open, 
So that means that you get to a lock, you have to wait until the next day to for it to open up. And also by having uh, these sort of mobile opening crews, see that each of the 40 something locks doesn't now have a little house next to it where someone lives who opens and closes the lock, but instead you have some that are permanently staffed and others in which crews in a, a small motorboat then you know accompany boats going through the lock system to go and open the and close the locks for them and then return back to their uh, original the crew returns back to its starting point and what that means is that it becomes more difficult to have sort of an effortless travel instead you have to wait for staff to show up right but if staff are expensive or you need a lot of staff to maintain this uh, then I can understand why Parks Canada, if if the canals aren't being used uh, at a level that would warrant staffing all of these sites all of the time, it makes a good business sense from their perspective not to staff the locks all the time. It, they also control sort of the the fees of of using the system uh, and. You know, generally the local tourist industry would like to see, I would imagine, these locks staffed 24 hours a day and the fees be zero because that means that it's a, a very, uh, it, I guess it would make it a, an experience that allows people to, it, with boats, to come and go as they please, which then would probably mean more business for the local tourism industry. If you decided to explore that, either in uh, this course or in the actual field course, or even as an undergraduate or graduate thesis or major research paper, a thing to be aware of is that, you know, to, to me at least, it's unclear if there's what we would call a long-term secular decline in boat traffic on uh, the Trent Severn waterway. So a long-term secular decline is basically a decline that is maybe not constant, but it, the tendency over time is that there is less and less boat traffic. That would be worth looking into if you were going to explore you know, the possible conflicts between the local tourist industry and, and Parks Canada. At one time, you could find on the internet some information about a group called the Trent Severn Waterway Working Group. And in 2015, they actually called for the TSW to come under a different management structure. And the reason they called for this was that they their claim was that there's been a 50% decline <clears throat> excuse me, between 1988 and 2007, so basically over a 20 year period in lock usage. That they don't, as I recall, say very much about, you know, any changes. Like they don't say, as I recall, but I could be wrong, you know, why did they pick 1988? Why did they stop in 2007? Uh, and they also, as I recall, don't discuss the how lock usage uh, practices changed or I guess maybe not so much I guess how staffing at the locks changed right but what they do and this is common for uh, any group that's having a problem they'll often blame whoever's you know running the critical infrastructure infrastructure so they blame Parks Canada for decline in lock usage but they don't actually say anything about trends in boating in North America or on the Great Lakes so maybe this 50% decline mirrors a 50% decline in the number of sailboats in you know North America or in Canada or you know maybe maybe it even mirrors a 100% decline in which that case uh, it means actually the Trent Severn Waterway is doing better than you might otherwise think it would. But they they don't provide, I guess the main point is that at the time that this working group was publishing this information, so you might think of this as a kind of gray literature, 
know, they didn't say anything about long-term trends in boating more generally. So we don't know if in Canada and in the United States there were more boaters, were there fewer boaters, were the same number of boaters. Uh, we don't know if other attractions opened up somewhere else outside of the Trent Severn waterways, right? So there's other factors here that you would want to explore if you wanted to determine if the Trent Severn waterway is suffering uh, because of management by Parks Canada or if it's suffering because the whole boating, the tourism boating, cell boating sector is also suffering, right? Or maybe it's a combination of those or maybe it's none of those as well, right?